From the hangar in Lancaster, California, I'm Jacobo Garrido. And I'm Tiffany Johnson. On this episode of L28 News, a report on Lancaster Police Department's impact since its creation less than a year ago, a look at additional home key housing and development here in the city, a highlight of the sixth annual Overcoming Obstacle track and field event held at AV High School, and a trip to Fire Station 129 for an afternoon of educational fun during the 25th annual Fire Service Day followed by coverage of the opening reception for the Museum of Art and History's Imprints exhibition. Local brewery Bravery Brewing Company partners with the MOA for their Pizza with a Purpose program. A stop by Borlero Lancaster's premier spot for bowling and fun, and a visit to Octane Roadhouse Pool House and Bar. The city of Lancaster's newly established police force is already showing promising results in improving law enforcement response times and enhancing community safety. Thanks to a collaborative effort between the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and Lancaster's law enforcement technicians, non-emergency call response times have been significantly reduced in 2024 compared to the previous year, with an average reduction of 91 minutes. This positive impact on response times is crucial for the safety and peace of mind of local residents. By having technicians handle non-emergency calls, sheriff deputies are able to prioritize emergencies effectively and efficiently ensuring that every 911 call receives prompt attention. Mayor R. Rex Paris expressed enthusiasm about the progress made, stating, We are thrilled to see the positive impact Lancaster's law enforcement technicians are bringing to their support of our LASD officers. We are excited to work alongside them to better serve our community in creating a safer Lancaster. When speaking on the recent success, Chief of Police Roderick Darmelin said, We are extremely thankful to our law enforcement technicians for their outstanding work in helping reduce call response times and stepping in to free up bandwidth for our deputies. Their dedication and expertise have enabled us to serve our community better and ensure your calls are handled as quickly as possible. The Lancaster Police Department, operating under a hybrid policing model in collaboration with LASD, is focused on targeting major and minor crimes to enhance public safety. This partnership allows LASD to concentrate on addressing major crimes while the police department handles routine calls and implements prevention programs. The effectiveness of this approach is evident in the reduced response times and the increased bandwidth available for handling emergency situations. The law enforcement technicians, as non-sworn personnel, play a critical role in providing administrative and supportive assistance to LASD, thereby optimizing resource allocation and improving overall service delivery. Residents seeking more information about the police department's initiatives and services can contact LPD at cityoflancasterca.gov. The collaborative efforts between Lancaster's law enforcement technicians and LASD underscore Lancaster's commitment to enhancing public safety and ensuring a proactive approach to law enforcement here in the community. Jacopo, how cool is that, that our city is really pouring into our sheriff's department so that they can be more hands-off and have our police department be more hands-on with intimate and local crimes? You know, Tiff, it's really cool because 91 minutes is a game changer mm -hmm. for anybody who's calling 911. So I think it's really going to help out our local residents and hopefully make everyone feel a little bit more safe. Absolutely. Building on the success of the Sierra's interim housing project, which converted former motels into a 38-unit facility for homeless individuals, the city of Lancaster is expanding its efforts with additional project home key sites aimed at providing permanent supportive housing for those in need. Project Home Key, a state-run program, facilitates the conversion of hotels, motels, and other existing buildings into permanent supportive housing for unhoused persons. Following the positive outcomes of the Sierra's project, the City Council recently introduced an ordinance to reduce the minimum floor area of efficiency units, enabling more motel conversions into supportive housing. Hope the mission, in collaboration with the City and Los Angeles County, is spearheading the next phase of Project Home Key by converting the Bon Air, T-Bird, and Sahara motels into additional sites offering a combined 60 efficiency units upon completion. Patty Garibay, Assistant Director for Community Development Planning and Permitting, emphasized that these conversions will not only provide much-needed housing, but also revitalize Sierra Highway by repurposing blighted motels for a crucial community use. Each facility will offer communal gathering areas and on-site open spaces, ensuring a supportive environment throughout reintegration efforts. The reduced floor area applies specifically to efficiency units intended for permanent supportive housing. 
Hope the Mission Area Director Billy Nettles expressed gratitude to the city for its partnership and highlighted the transformative impact of these initiatives on the local community. Reflecting on the challenges of the Sierras project, Nettles emphasized the value of perseverance in advancing the mission of providing second chances and supportive housing to vulnerable populations. Through Project Home Key, Lancaster continues to demonstrate its commitment to addressing homelessness and supporting the less fortunate, creating pathways for individuals to rebuild their lives and contribute positively to the community. To learn more about the fight against homelessness here in the city, be sure to stay tuned to L28 News. Great report, Tiff. Um, but not only that, it's really nice to see that local nonprofits are coming together to kind of revamp Sierra Highway, uh, get rid of the old motels and make them useful. Yeah, and I love the initiative that we're really helping the houseless community to get back into society and not just putting a Band-Aid on it. Yep. Don't go anywhere. When we return from the break, the team brings viewers a recap of the sixth annual Overcoming Obstacles event, which invited over 500 students across the school district to participate in track and field events. Afterwards, we bring viewers a recap of the 25th annual Fire Service Day, a morning filled with fun as the community connected with first responders from all over the Antelope Valley. Welcome back to L28. Next, we'll be covering the Overcoming Obstacles event where over 500 students with developmental disabilities were invited to AV High School for a morning full of friendly competition in track and field. Then we stopped by the 25th annual Fire Service Day, which invited the community out for a morning field with educational fun. During the month of April, L28 Sports was able to not only attend, but also live broadcast the annual Overcoming Obstacles Unified Track Meet. This event, hosted by Antelope Valley High School on Mays Field at Brett Newcomb Stadium, provides an opportunity for students with developmental and intellectual disabilities to compete both on the track and field against one another in events ranging from 50 to 200 meter sprints, tennis ball shot put, and relay races. Vice Principal of Antelope Valley High School, John Nahar, has led this event as well as the basketball branch of Overcoming Obstacles and has truly fortified a space for students from every walk of life to excel and feel the true meaning of inclusion. All eight high schools from the Golden League were in attendance, which includes but are not limited to Lancaster High School, Quartz Hill High School, Pete Knight High School, and even Little Rock High School. The competing athletes were not only athletes on the field as each school had a current sports team volunteer their time and talents to help build a better experience for the athletes of overcoming obstacles. The surrounding lot of the track was full of food trucks offering familiar traditional sporting event treats such as hot dogs and pepper bellies. There even was a special treat of the locally famous Kona Ice. A great touch provided by our local schools was their attendance of their cheer squads, mascots, and the Antelope Valley High School's marching band. After the completion of the competitions, fans were able to cheer and shout from the stands in support of their favorite athletes as they received their awards during the closeout ceremony. With over 500 students in attendance, Pete Knight stood out with their athletic excellence by receiving the most awards of the afternoon. If you would like to get involved or know a student athlete that would excel at overcoming obstacles, please contact John Nahar, Vice Principal of Antelope Valley High School at jnahar at avhsd.org for more information. Jacobo, it was so great to be there physically at Overcoming Obstacles and really see everyone just come together. Those athletes were having the time of their life and really felt seen. They really were. And, you know, their motor doesn't stop because mm -hmm. prior to their events, they're up dancing, you know, having fun, even singing. So these athletes had the time of their life, like you said, and I'm excited for next year's coverage. Working with those with intellectual disabilities, I've definitely learned that we learn more from them than they learn from us. You're right. Step into the heart of community unity and see firsthand how Fire Station 129 celebrated the 25th annual Fire Service Day. Enthusiastic crowds gathered for a morning of interactive demonstrations and heartfelt connections with first responders. From mastering the art of building blazes to an adrenaline pumping Jaws of Life demonstration, attendees absorbed vital safety know-how. Amidst the excitement, food trucks kept attendees well-fed and vendors showcased an array of merchandise. The event not only fortified bonds between heroes and citizens, but also fostered a collective spirit of preparedness and gratitude. Join us as we relive the exhilaration and camaraderie of this unforgettable celebration right here on L28 News. So this is the 25th annual Fire Service Day. 
Uh, this is a place for the community to come see what we do. It's an inside look of our day to day. Uh, so it's uh, we've got all types of rescue equipment. So we've got our trucks, our engines. Uh, we've got a lot of our wildland equipment like bulldozers. Um, we've got our, our heavy rescue, USAR, our helicopter right behind me here. Uh, and we simulate a few of the things that we do on a daily basis. Uh, we just had a car fire. This car behind me was just cut open by, uh, by my crew. I did a great job simulating a traffic collision where someone's trapped inside and they can't get out. So we have to get them out. Um, and then there's, there's good music, food, and vendors, and uh, it's all around good time for the community. Fire Station 129 was packed the morning of May 4th as guests from all over attended the 25th annual Fire Service Day, a tradition that brings the community closer to those in the business of saving lives. Throughout the event, those in attendance had the chance to watch how first responders work, bearing witness to what kind of situations they may be put in. These included extinguishing a vehicle that caught on fire, watching firemen zip line, and more. The excitement didn't stop there, as guests of all ages had the opportunity to suit up in a fireman's suit and learn the basics of the fireman's hose, fixing their aim on a building caught in a make-believe fire. Brian Van Dyke, a pilot who operates the Black Hawk helicopter, took the time to explain to viewers the dynamics of the life-saving aircraft. Let's take a look. What you have behind you is the Black Hawk, and it's a crew of three. It's a pilot and two medics, the two paramedics, the pilot's an EMT. Uh, the one medic is a crew chief. He runs the winch and the cable. So when we did the demonstration earlier, he was hanging out the side of the aircraft, running the cable. The other fireman goes down. He's a downside medic. He deals with the patient on the ground. If he needs more equipment, a medical bag, backboard, hot seat, calls up to us. We put it back on the cable, come back around, lower it down to him. Then when you bring the patient back up into the aircraft, if he's critical, both medics can work on the work on the patient tandem while we go en route to the hospital. Attendees also had the opportunity to take part in photo ops, creating memories that will last a lifetime. There was also an area selling merchandise that stayed packed throughout the event as guests purchased clothing in support of friends and family in the fire department. Food trucks and vendors kept guests satisfied as they continued their morning learning more about life-saving techniques and the amount of training and dedication that goes into being a first responder. This career is not for everybody. It's a, it's a difficult career. There's um, a lot of challenges that come with it, but uh, you can schedule a ride along or a station visit and come check it out. And, and, uh, and then you can see for yourself if it's really something you're interested in. And if it is, we can guide you down that path. To ensure you don't miss the latest news in city updates, employment opportunities, and community gatherings, be sure to follow the city on Instagram at City of Lancaster CA. You know what, Tiffany, during the event, I actually saw a little girl saying, my dad is a fireman, and I totally thought of you. Yeah, it's like the best title to have. My dad is a retired fireman, but he used to play for the NFL. Most people think he'd have more pride in that, but he actually had more pride in serving our community. So kudos to those little girls. It's the best title to have to say, my dad is a firefighter. And shout out to all our local firefighters for keeping us safe. Absolutely. When we return from the break, L28 will be covering the opening reception for the Museum of Art and History's Imprints Exhibit, a collection of work from six artists who showcase their talents through an array of mediums. Afterwards, the team speaks with Dr. Bruce Love, who curated The Valley is Sacred. The ancestors are speaking, a multimedia exhibit that shows the harsh reality and triumphs of the Native people who have lived here in the AV since the dawn of time. Thank you for tuning in to L28 News. The team will be bringing viewers a recap of the debut of Imprints at the MOA, an exhibition that studies the relationship between the human race and our impact on society. Along with This Valley is Sacred, an exhibit curated by Dr. Love, which examines the history of the first native peoples to call the AV home. The Museum of Art and History's Imprints made a resounding debut during its opening reception in early May, showcasing the profound relationship between humanity and the natural world. The exhibit features works from six diverse artists, each offering a unique perspective on environmental impact. At the heart of the exhibition lies Anne Diner's captivating series, The Invented Land. Housed within the main gallery, Diner's work pays homage to the transformative nature of human intervention in landscapes. Visitors are drawn into a world where leaf-shaped translucent sun catchers are neatly arranged on a large wood shed-like structure, creating a scene of beauty intertwined with the stark reality of environmental change. Diner's inspiration stems from the profound shifts she witnessed while visiting her late grandparents' farm, 
where the landscape underwent a dramatic transformation, making it nearly unrecognizable. Adjacent to Diner's immersive installation stands Terry Arena's thought-provoking series, Natural Capital. Arena's work delves into the consequences of exploitation of environmental resources fueled by society. She highlights the alarming depletion of natural landscapes, such as the collapse of Lake Tulare, attributed to human infrastructure such as dams, canals, and ditches. However, Arena also captures moments of hope illustrating nature's resilience with the rebirth of Lake Tulare in 2023, following a downpour of rainfall that revitalized many forgotten bodies of water. Charles Hood, artist of underwater, gives viewers an overview of his work that was featured in the second floor of the imprint's exhibit, how viewers can stay up to date with the latest works, along with a special message to MOA. Let's head to the boulevard for more. This is a piece that is documenting how water arrives in Southern California. So water comes out of the sky, flies to the pipes, goes into our houses, and then goes on its journey. And a lot of people don't really think about the way in which we exploit water, manipulate water, transfer water, who owns water, who controls it, who says yes or no. So this is literally the Los Angeles aqueduct. Half of the water of Los Angeles flows through this pipe that we see behind us, and the other half flows through an adjacent pipe just around the corner. And this is dating all the way back to 1913, William Mulholland. And one of the interesting things is as they take water from the Owens Valley and bring it to Los Angeles, it passes right through the Antelope Valley, where we are now, crosses the desert, typically underground. Here we have a little bit of an above ground part and no one touches it. We're very polite here in the Antelope Valley. I can tell you, if we were in another country, people would be punching holes in that pipe, siphoning off the water, objecting, redirecting, and we let it pass under the kind of gentleman's agreement that, well, water rights are important. And one of the things this wants to ask is, well, why do we let the water pass by without any kind of local utilization? And also then to do a mirroring between the sky, the pipe, and then reversing the sky so it looks like water, because water starts in the sky and it ends up flowing into the ground sooner or later. When it leaves our homes in the Antelope Valley, most of us, if we're washing the dishes or we're using the shower, it ends up at Avenue D. Perhaps people have seen that treatment plant at Highway 138, Avenue D and the 14 Freeway. So for us, our water is containerized here in the Antelope Valley. However, for Los Angeles, most of their water ends up going into the Los Angeles River and then flowing out into the ocean. So this pipe really wants, this, this series of pipes really wants to say, Who's controlling the water? Where are we directing it to? Where is its end result going to be? L28 spoke with artist Deborah Skako, whose serious misplaced rain studies the relationship between water and human imbalance. Why, as society, it's important to recognize the impact that we can have on the environment and more. Let's head to the MOA. Misplaced Rain is an extension of the work that I started with my last show at MOA um, that was looking at the relationship between aqueducts, dams, and soil. And so for misplaced rain, I, I kind of continue the research on aqueducts and how water moves from and where to. And uh, I came across this quote from uh, Engineering with Nature, which is the, it, it was a 1942 publication that basically refers to the, the contrast in um, population versus water access, right? So it basically, instead of saying, you know, it was saying like in Northern California, there's a bulk of the rain and in Southern California was a bulk of the people. So as opposed to acknowledging that there was a, a human imbalance, it was referred to as misplaced rain. And so that term just really struck me as being emblematic of how um, humans have really tried to engineer nature into contemporary uh, desire for infinite expansion. So across the series, what you're seeing is five forms of California clay. And each piece is a two or three of those aspects of California clay that have actually been sort of like woven and marbled and worked together. So what you're actually seeing is like the, the unification of earth bodies onto a single plane in acknowledgement that we're all connected by water, right? And then the pieces are titled for, um, it's actually a kind of children's diagram of how ecosystems are connected. So a lot of this work is really acknowledging the fact that we're all connected by water, we're all connected by air, we're all connected by soil. Right. So each of these pieces is named for an animal in that ecosystem. So it's like toad, rabbit, fox, owl, because if you remove one aspect of the ecosystem, the entire thing changes. And in some aspects, the entire thing is at risk of collapse. So the pieces are like I, I think of them as a kind of hybrid between an animal and a landscape. 
and really, again, thinking about the interconnection of all living systems as humans, we are like one aspect of these interconnected cycles. So I kind of wanted to mix it up between um, abstract forms and very identifiable, almost like elementary life forms as we think of them. Afterwards, Ancient Futurism by Serena J.V. Elston. This series of work focuses on mythology and changes the narrative to represent what it means to look at stories of old in a new light. As she dives deeper into each of her works and what they depict, let's hear what she had to say. Um, so this show is a collection of some older works and the body of work that I'm focusing on right now. And I think ancient futurism is a really good way to um, compartmentalize the way in which I imagine historical um, facts and the way in which the narratives influence and inform contemporary thinking. Um, so I've been running a project called Siren Island um, that is a physical space. We kind of ask the question of what would a land look like or feel like if it was never affected by colonialism? And the answer we came up with is there is no such thing. So we have to invent the land. And so it became almost like a magical realism made real. Uh, and so we got to perform the liberation of like the feminine body. Imprints offers a thought-provoking narrative that urges viewers to reflect on humanity's profound impact on the natural world, while also instilling a sense of optimism for the potential of environmental regeneration. As visitors explore the exhibition, they are met with a powerful dialogue between art and the environment, challenging perceptions and creating conversations on the urgent need for conservation and sustainability. To stay up to date with all things going on in Lancaster's art hubs, be sure to visit LancasterMOA.org. In a blend of history, culture, and resilience, the Lancaster Museum of Art and History has unveiled its long-awaited exhibition, This Valley is Sacred, The Ancestors Are Speaking. Three years in the making, the exhibition is a testament to the collaborative efforts of Dr. Bruce Love, alongside Latipa, the University of California Riverside's Director of the Memory and Resistance Laboratory. Spearheaded by the Lancaster Museum of Art and History's Native American Advisory Council in collaboration with representatives from the seven tribes of the Antelope Valley, the exhibition stands as a powerful homage to the region's indigenous heritage. During the opening reception, L28 had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Love, who shares with viewers a brief history of what the California Native people lived through, why he feels it's important to continue to remember the past and pay those respects, resources that viewers can turn to for further education, and more. Well, the Native peoples of the Antelope Valley can still hear their ancestors today, and the ancestors go back to the beginning of time. Archaeologists have found proof of Native occupation of the Antelope Valley back 12,000 years. But the Natives say they've always been here. The purpose of this show is to give them the respect and the honor that they deserve, the recognition that they deserve. Because when people think of Indians, they think of Plains Indians, they think of teepees and feather headdresses and horses. And that's not California Indians. The California Indians were, there's one of the most populous states as far as native occupation, had a higher population some of the most complex societies, complex linguistics, languages of anywhere in the US, starting in the 18th century with the missions and then the gold rush and the settlers and the miners and the militias. The California Indian population was decimated by 90 to 95%. Within 130 years, the population went from 310,000 to 16,000 in 130 years and the remnants of those people have been struggling ever since to maintain and build and rebuild. And that's what the, the Resilience and Recovery Room is all about. These people are here today and they're not going away and they will always be here. And they're passing this on to their children. There's lots of people writing books nowadays about, like if you look in the room three here, the genocide room, there you can see the covers of the books that tell the story of the genocide and the militias and the, I mean, state-sponsored militias that were murdering Indians and 
reimbursed by the state legislature. Um, I mean, that, but that history is being told. As visitors embark on a journey through the exhibition's immersive rooms, they are greeted with historical insight and personal anecdotes from the tribes that have long called the Antelope Valley home. Room two transformed into a desert landscape transports patrons to the heart of the desert night, enveloping them in the chilling beauty of the landscape. It's room three that serves as the exhibition's emotional core, with five monitors displaying the harrowing atrocities inflicted upon the native people. From deliberate spread of disease to the systematic injustices perpetuated by those in power, viewers are confronted with the harsh realities of native suffering, no longer being able to shield themselves or turn a blind eye. However, amidst the darkness, Room 4 emerges as a beacon of hope, showcasing the resilient spirit of indigenous culture. Here, tribe leaders work tirelessly to revive and reclaim their heritage, offering a glimpse into a future shaped by strength and determination. This valley is sacred, the ancestors are speaking, not only serves as a reminder of the injustice of the past, but also celebrates the enduring legacy of native resilience. Through its powerful narrative and immersive experiences, the exhibition invites visitors to bear witness to a history that refuses to be silenced. You know what, Tiffany, it's really cool to see that the MOA is kind of paying homage to the past. You know, uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that there was native people living here thousands of years ago. Yeah, I was born and raised in the city of Lancaster, and I didn't have the knowledge until now that this is native land that we're living on. And it's really comforting to know that there are communities that feel unjustified, that feel now they can speak up and have validation. We're glad you could join us today. And when we come back from the commercial break, today's episode will be concluding with a small business segment as the team takes a look at the partnership between Bravery Brewing Company and the Museum of Art and History for their Pizza with a Purpose program, followed by a visit to Octane Roadhouse to check out everything going on in this one-of-a-kind establishment. Congratulations on joining L28's Watch Till the End Club. Up next, the partnership between Bravery Brewing Company and the Boulevard's MOA for their Pizza with a Purpose program. Afterwards, L28 brings viewers a closer look at Octane Roadhouse, a modern pool bar that's changing the game with its rock and roll vibe and array of entertainment options. In a heartwarming display of community spirit, Bravery Brewing and its Pizza Kitchen have partnered with the MOA Foundation for their Pizza with a Purpose program campaign throughout the month of April. Every pizza purchase helped to support the MOA Foundation's initiatives, which play a vital role in enriching the community through art and education. Their programs often bring art into the public spaces and foster an environment where creativity thrives. This isn't the first time Bravery Brewing has leveraged their delicious pizzas for a good cause. A similar event in December of last year proved to be a huge success, with the brewery donating approximately $2,400 from pizza sales alone. Their Pizza with a Purpose program underscores the brewery's commitment to community welfare and continuous support to various causes. Pizza with a Purpose is something that we were really excited about to be able to give back to our community. So every pizza, we give $1 to a different nonprofit that we handpick here at Bravery Brewing. We also invite the nonprofits to come in and talk to all of our like, patrons and guests and really inform them about what they're doing in the community and what they offer. Bravery Brewing is known for not only its quality craft beers, but also for creating a communal environment. The brewery prides itself on being an integral part of the local community, continuously engaging in charitable activities, and providing a venue where significant local events are celebrated. Bravery Brewing Pizza with a Purpose is a great example of how local businesses can engage with charitable organizations to make a significant impact. The collaboration between Bravery Brewing and the MOA Foundation is a delicious opportunity for the community to engage in generosity simply by enjoying a well-made pizza. Whether it's their classic margarita or their fan favorite meaty boy pizza, patrons can feel good about where their money is going, supporting the arts, and fostering educational opportunities here in the community. Jacobo, I can definitely say that every time I've been to Bravery Brewing, it is very clear that their priority is community over business. So it's great to see that they're using their great recipes for a great purpose. You're definitely right. They really put quality over anything. And when we filmed Tiff on the Town, mm -hmm. 
we got to try, I think, like three different pizzas. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, revving up their engine or, you know, lying here. Like their pizzas were good. So They're good. Very good. So good. So if you're watching this and you haven't had a chance to try their pizza yet, I would definitely recommend it. ASAP. Get ready to rev up your nightlife experience in Lancaster with Octane Roadhouse, a dynamic bar that brings a unique blend of rock and roll attitude and garage inspired vibes to the heart of the city. Established in 2018, Octane Roadhouse offers a thrilling destination where locals can unwind, socialize, and enjoy a range of entertainment options under one roof. From an array of 28 ice-cold draft beers to interactive games like pool, extra-large Jenga, darts, and cornhole, Octane Roadhouse promises an unforgettable night out. Whether you're catching the game on a full projector screen or indulging in handcrafted pizzas and other bar favorites, Octane Roadhouse is the ultimate hotspot for cold beer and a good time. Let's now head to Octane Roadhouse to meet our correspondent, Jacobo Garrido, with the full coverage. What's going on, Lancaster? This is Jacobo Garrido reporting for L28 News. And as you can currently see behind me, I'm at Octane Roadhouse to grab a beer and play some pool. Follow along with me and let's go check it out. Octane Roadhouse is revving up the local night scene here in Lancaster with its modern garage vibe and eclectic entertainment offerings. Originally opening in 2018, this one-of-a-kind establishment boasts a unique blend of rock and roll attitude and laid-back garage ambiance that sets it apart as a hotspot for both locals and visitors alike. This energetic bar offers a variety of activities making it the perfect place to catch the game or unwind with friends. From pool tables to XL Jenga, darts, and even cornhole, Octane Roadhouse ensures there's never a dull moment. Guests can also indulge from an impressive selection of 28 ice-cold draft beers, open bar, and when you get hungry, delicious bar food, including their fan favorite handcrafted pizzas. But the fun doesn't end there. Octane Roadhouse is not just about drinks and games, it's a full entertainment experience. The bar features a projector for screening games, enhancing the atmosphere for sports enthusiasts. Additionally, the establishment has future plans to expand its offerings with a complete wine bar, adding to its appeal as a versatile destination for any visitor. During the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, Octane took the opportunity to revamp its image, ensuring that it remains a vibrant and inviting venue for patrons. The bar's owners have invested in improvements, including plans for a full patio with fire pits and a cigar lounge, enhancing the overall experience for its guests. To add to the excitement, Octane hosts a competitive pool tournament on the first Sunday of every month, as well as a cornhole tournament every Wednesday nights, attracting enthusiasts and competitors from the local community. With its commitment to providing a dynamic and welcoming atmosphere, Octane Roadhouse is not just a bar. It's a hub for cold beer, good times, and memorable experiences. Whether you're stopping by for a game, a drink, or simply to soak in the energetic ambiance, Octane promises an unforgettable night out in Lancaster. Whether you're coming for the drinks, to play pool, or just to catch a game, you gotta make sure to check out the Octane Roadhouse because you're sure to have a great time. This has been Jacobo Garrido reporting for L28 News. We're going to throw it back to you guys there in the studio. You know what, Tiffany? That was a really fun story to cover. Um, when you walk in, you don't realize how big the space actually is. There's tons of pool tables. They even have cornhole. It's a really cool place to be. It looked like a blast. It looked like you had the time of your life. And it's great to see that small businesses in Lancaster are bringing initiatives and ideas from L.A. into our city so we don't have to commute out to enjoy each other. Oh, yeah, you're totally right. And when we were speaking to the owners, he mentioned that he actually invites a lot of teams from L.A. either to play cornhole or just to play pool. That's so cool. Well, thank you for tuning into the City of Lancaster's News. I'm Jacobo Garrido. And I'm Tiffany Johnson. And this has been L28, L28 News. News.